Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Uh, we're really excited uh, for today's Hangout. It's one of our last Hangouts of the month of April. It's been a pretty crazy month. One of our consistent themes this month has been looking at climate change. And today we are joining Rachel Bell Irving at the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, for an ocean-wise virtual hangout. We're really excited about that. And many of you may know all about coral reefs. They're like the rainforest of the sea, uh, taking up such a small area of the ocean floor, yet harboring a vast majority of the biodiversity that we can find in our oceans. And many of you may know as well, they're being affected by global warming, whether it's from bleaching or ocean acidification, coral reefs are in trouble. Rachel, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today from uh, the Vancouver Aquarium. We're excited to learn a little bit more about coral reefs and then uh, obviously check out the characters you have joining us in the background and then we'll let the classrooms fire away with some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And good morning, good afternoon, everybody. As Joe said, my name is Rachel and I am an educator for OceanWise. OceanWise is an international conservation association and we are based out of Vancouver at the Vancouver Aquarium. And our focuses are all about connecting everybody with the ocean, becoming a little bit more OceanWise and living lives through an ocean lens. And there's lots of ways that we can make smart ocean choices every single day that are going to impact incredible animals like the ones I have behind me that are very active this morning, which is awesome. Hopefully you're seeing our wonderful rip ray, uh, whip ray climbing up the glass there. I'm standing in front of our coral reef shark habitat at the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, Vancouver Aquarium, if you've ever been to Vancouver, it's located in Stanley Park, which is right on the Western side of Canada, very close to the Seattle border, or the Washington border, sorry. And we are on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations people. So we are surrounded by amazing biodiversity here. Today we're gonna look at obviously the ecosystem a little bit farther away from us, which is coral reefs. And behind me is a very good example of what kind of life you would see in a coral reef. Of course, we've got our rays, we've got some sharks and some tropical fish swimming around, and you might even spot our green sea turtle scuna, who is a rescued and non-releasable animal. So hopefully you'll see some action going on behind me, as well as I'm gonna share a few pictures with you and a few videos and whatnot, talking about coral reefs, because coral reefs, it's a big word, it's a buzzword, we throw it around all the time, and I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment and just think for 30 seconds in your mind, picture, what comes to mind when you think of a coral reef? What sort of shapes do you see? What kind of colors? What sort of movement and light do you see? I like to describe coral reefs as a jungle gym because that's really what they are at the bottom of the ocean. So with your coral picture in your mind, let's dive in and take a look at what corals are. You're gonna see Joe's face for a moment there, uh, but then I do have some fun photos to show you. So. Many of you might have pictured something similar to this, maybe a little bit different. This is just one example of what a coral reef might look like. We've got lots of colors. We've got tons of different shapes. It's a very complex habitat, and that's in a very important role that it plays in the ecosystem. Now, many people look at this and think that corals are plants or rocks or something non-living. But in fact, if we take a little bit of a closer look, just by being a bit curious, we can get a little bit closer and we see that these corals are made up of tiny individual animals called polyps. So these polyps all live together in a colony and that colony is what we call a coral reef. So if I zoom in even a little bit closer, we'll get a good look at what those individual polyps look like. <laughs> so here's a really zoomed in picture on some of those individual coral coral polyps. And they are amazing little animals. Each one of those little stalks is an animal. And they belong to the phyla cnidarian. So cnidarians include the coral polyps. They include sea anemones. And they also include jellyfish. If anyone's ever gone swimming with a jellyfish, I'm very sorry, I hope you were not stung, it's not fun. Uh, but all these animals are related to each other because they have that amazing stinging ability. So sometimes even if we touch corals, we can actually get stung, which again, it's not a very pleasant experience. So these individual corals, they build up an amazing structure underneath them, which you can see in the orange there. And they're building a giant skeleton on which they can sit 
and live together and be um, building this amazing coral reef habitat. So once the corals have built up their skeletons and they've built up that amazing structures, that is what gives us coral reefs, beautiful and complex habitats. So underneath the corals is their skeleton that is made out of what's a fancy word, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, you can actually find it in your classroom. It's also chalk. Uh, so if you ever feel how chalk is, what the way it feels, how brittle and easy it can break, that is the structure that corals build to help support themselves in the ecosystem. So underneath all those beautiful colors are layers and layers of calcium carbonate that give us these really cool and very complex shapes. And corals are not just in warm water, which many people believe, they can also be found in cold water. So on our dive trips as OceanWise researchers down in a lot of the West Coast as well as in the Arctic, we can find corals in these dark and cold water areas. Very different species, but still serving a very similar purpose. They have uh, homes for these animals. They might also be food for some animals and places to hide. It's basically an, another animal giving a home for other animals. So zooming in, you can see there's some shrimp. Uh, there's some worms there. A couple actually looks like a sea cucumber, which is pretty cool. And we'll see these corals not only in tropical areas, but also in the warmer waters. And so many different animals use corals for a number of different reasons. And I would like to take a pause. I already listed some reasons, but here is a wabagong shark. A wabagong shark is a predator. It does like to eat the other fish in the coral reef. So my question for you, and Joe, hopefully you can help me go to each of the classes for some ideas. How do you think a wabagong shark, a predator, uses the coral reefs? Uh, as its home. Like, what is it getting from the coral reefs? All right, we'll give you maybe 10, 15 seconds to think about how that predator uses a coral reef. Uh, and then we'll visit a few classrooms. We'll put you on the spot. Dun, dun, dun. I was lucky enough to see some of those carpet sharks in Australia when I lived there and did some diving. They are really cool sharks. That is on my bucket list. I would love to see a guavagong shark. All right, let's start picking on some classrooms. Let's start. Uh, Mrs. Hans's group, how do you think the Wabagong, that predator, is using the coral reef? All right, guys, who wants to answer? Go ahead, Chuck, Archie. Tell us what they're They use their camouflage. Hey, nice, yeah, so they're camouflaging in with the coral reef. That's fantastic. Let's get another class to add to that. It's using camouflage. All right. How, why, what? Mrs. Wong's class, your microphone's on. What do you think? Since there are hiding in the coral reef where lots of fish are swimming, the fish might not see them and they can jump out and attack. Yeah, oh, so maybe they're using that camouflage for ambushing their prey in the coral. That, I like that you're using your observations to pull that conclusion, very cool. Anyone else, other classrooms to add to that? Maybe one more and we'll have another question later on. All right, Mrs. Thompson's group in Peterborough, what do you think? Um, They use their camouflage and once they jump out at them, they can bring them back in, so then they can have a nice meal. <laughs> That's awesome, exactly, yeah, you get a tasty meal. And you're exactly right. That's exactly what scientists have observed the wabagong shark doing. They're hiding in the coral thanks to their amazing camouflage. And then they're able to ambush. They're able to jump out at their prey, at the other little fish that are swimming in the corals. So even predators, can use corals, but what about their prey? Because we've got some more classrooms. I'd love to ask the other classrooms, how do you think the smaller fish use the coral? All right, we'll give you a couple seconds and then I'm gonna start picking on the classrooms we haven't been to yet. So you're probably coming up if I haven't opened your mic. Uh, Mrs. Devine's group, what do you think? How do the smaller fish use the coral? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so I would say that the fish Sometimes they're small enough to at least get through the little crevices inside the coral as coral is normally separated than just one big lump of uh, little tiny organisms. So they would slip inside the crevice and they wouldn't use, the, use it as camouflage help, but normally as like a hiding place. 
That's fantastic. I love that you like took all that information and tied it together in a really nice little bow there. That was fantastic. So complex habitat means there's lots of places to hide. So perfect hiding place, great home for little fish. Awesome. What other ways could they use uh, some corals for the other classes? All right, Mrs. Harrison's group, you're up to bat. They use it as protection. Protection, that's a really great word. All animals have to have protection of some kind, and that ties right back into the other class. So great teamwork. We've got protection. They can hide in the corals. Awesome. All right, and I think we need to visit Mrs. Pimentel's group and see what happens. Hi, everybody. They hide from their prey. They hide from their prey, they hide from their predators. Awesome, yes, we're using a lot of those keywords. I like it. Uh, what do you think? Mrs. Leeds Group hasn't typed in an answer. If you guys have one, you could type in an answer. I think we've picked on everybody at least one, so let's pick on Mrs. Hans's group again. Okay, shut it out, go ahead, Morgan. Um, they, they use it for, uh, like, valley fish. <laughs> Um, they use that for their home and also for protection. Nice. That's a really great job of adding in another animal that lives in coral reefs. Because we've got many more things than just fish living in coral reefs. We've also got things like sea anemones. So Nemo's home. And you've got relationships that are building within animals. So that and is our, fantastic. Our class in Texas said they probably find some food around there. Hey, nicely done. Yeah, they can also find their food in the coral reefs. You are looking at that perfect little ecosystem that has everything you can possibly need. It's got the food at the bottom of the food chain, which actually can be corals. Some animals like to eat corals, like parrotfish, for example. And then you've also got other animals like the bigger sharks that might prey on the little fish. So coral reefs have a lot of different roles to play in the ecosystem. Uh, food for other animals, as well as places to hide, the shelter, and they connect back to people as well because where can we find most of our seafood? Coral reefs are a great place to look, especially when we think of smaller fish, when we think of crustaceans like crabs and clams and mussels. And also this, because it's such a great hiding place, is a nursery for little baby fish that eventually might spend their adult lives out in the wider ocean. So the fish that we later on want to hunt for, their babies have to have a safe place to grow up, which could be coral reefs. So even humans are finding a way to connect back to coral reefs. And it gives us also things like jobs. So people who want to go scuba diving and bring tourists with them, people who want to go swimming when they're on vacation. Many people like to try and travel to these places because they look so cool. So we're also getting in part for humans, our food source, a water source, uh, economy and job source as well. Coral reefs support so much more than just their own ecosystem. They can support the entire global ocean with what they are able to provide with us. So really, really cool animals. And as Joe mentioned from the start, we also do have a number of threats facing these animals that we're still starting to understand a little bit better. So again, I'm gonna go back to my pictures. You'll see Joe for a wonderful moment. We've got our Wobba Gong Shark. And then I wanna mention another special uh, player in this game that I haven't mentioned yet. And that is Zozantheli. Zozantheli, if you wanna try and say it yourself, Zozan. Zozanthelli Zozanthelli is a special type of algae. So it's a living plant-like organism. And this algae actually lives inside each and every polyp. So if you imagine again, those little tiny polyps that kind of look like sea anemones, inside each of those polyps are zozanthelli. Zozanthelli being algae. And together with the polyps, they have a symbiotic relationship. So they're working together in order to survive. And here's how the relationship works. The zozanthelli have a place to hide. They've got a safe, wonderful home inside of the individual polyps. And in turn, they're able to photosynthesize. So they are able to take energy from the sun and convert that into food that both the zozanthelli and the polyps can benefit from. So the zozanthelli are making 80% of the food for these tropical polyps. And this in relationship is really important because this is what enables the polyps to survive. They get most of their food from the zooxanthellae living inside of their bodies. So what happens when their environment starts to change at a really drastic rate and they're starting to get stressed out and confused? And this is where coral bleaching comes in. 
So this is a really good picture that was created by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association down in the United States. And this is a really great diagram that explains essentially what is happening. You've got coral and the algae living together that are helping each other survive. With climate change, with the, what we're seeing is the water temperatures are increasing at a faster rate than seen in the past. And this dramatic change, even though it's only a few decimals of temperature to humans, when you are the size of your pinky finger or smaller, that is a really big change. And it's causing a lot of stress for the animals. So when the algae gets stressed, they abandon the coral. The coral is losing its food source and it's also losing its color. It's that wonderful photosynthesis that gives the corals their really bright colors that we see underwater. And so without the algae, the coral is left what we call bleached and vulnerable. So bleached is when they are white, but it's because they've lost their major food source. So a couple of things can happen. Uh, one, they obviously can starve, which is a big scary thought, uh, but it also makes them sicker and weaker, more vulnerable to disease. If you think about when you're really, really tired or if you're really, really stressed, your body is so busy worrying about that, it makes it harder to fight off things like a cold. And corals are the same way. When they're dealing with a lot of environmental stress, they're not able to fight off as many diseases that they might face. So here's a picture of a healthy coral beside a bleached coral. And you can see there's quite a big difference. So what researchers are really concerned about is how much coral bleaching is going on, particularly in the uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which is the largest barrier, uh, sorry, largest coral reef in the world. Uh, we're worried about, a, I think as of 2016, it was calculated about half of the corals were bleached. Just because they're bleached does not mean they're dead necessarily. They actually have been seen to come back on occasion, but it is extremely difficult because you've lost that major food source. So that is just one of the many threats that face corals. There are a lot more, unfortunately. Uh, the good thing, though, is that we know many of these uh, Many of these threats do come from human cause, which means that we can find solutions because we know what the problem is. So when it comes to finding solutions for coral reefs, there's a number of different things we can do. Uh, one, of course, is being just coral conscientious. If you ever get to visit a place that has coral reefs, be aware of where you are, pay attention to the corals. Please do not stand on the corals. Remember, they're made of the same thing as chalk. They're super fragile. And if we step on them, we can break them. Corals take hundreds of years to grow. And this is why researchers are concerned with the bleaching, with damage from fishing, with damage from tourists. They can break in a second, even though they take hundreds of years to grow. So with the warming temperatures, we're thinking this is likely due to be the excessive carbon emissions, which means reducing the amount of energy we use is another great way to have an impact. The oceans are connected all around the world. So anything from our ocean here beside us can go to that ocean there and back again. So being just a little bit coral conscientious, being a little bit ocean wise is a great way every single day to make a difference for animals like corals that support so much more life in the ecosystem. So that's my challenge for you later on today is think about one ocean wise decision that you can make, whether that is about how much energy you're wasting, whether that's about maybe your garbage or plastic waste. There's lots of different things that you can choose that will help animals all around the world. And the corals will thank you as well as all the other animals that need them to survive. So we've got lots of time for questions or curiosities, and I open the floor to that. All right, Rachel, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, great presentation. Uh, corals are so amazing. I'm, I'm, every time I get to explore a new coral reef is always a great time. And you were talking about sources and things that we get from them. And, and I want to share a quick story uh, with our classrooms that may make them look at tropical sand a little bit differently. And so when I'm diving, on the reefs, I always see parrotfish. Parrotfish, they look like they have little beaks and it's always loud because they're crunch, 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 crunching on the coral. And then as you watch them for long enough, you see they poop out sand. So when you're on those really nice coral beaches, think about it, all that sand passed through a parrotfish. So I think that's kind of really cool to think about. Uh, another thing that comes from coral reefs, thanks to the parrotfish. It's all connected. All right. Let's meet some classrooms. Um, first of all, I wanna give a shout out to Mrs. Leeds, a uh, group who's hanging out with us from Seguin, Texas. Use that chat sidebar, make sure you get some questions to us and I'll make sure that I work them in. Uh, but let's get started with a live classroom. Let's start with, uh, let's go to Mrs. Pimentel's group. They're hanging out in North York 
uh, Ontario, some grade four or five. So let's get that microphone turned on. Hi. How are you doing, grade four? Five? Hello. <laughs> All right, who's up with the question? Um, me. I am. Me, me, me. <laughs> Oh, where have I been underwater? That's a thank you for question. Oh, thank you for asking that. It's a nice question. I have dived in British Columbia, which is very exciting. It's cold, but it actually does have a lot of really cool animals and some neat shipwrecks. So diving in cold water can be just as interesting as diving in warm water. Uh, but I also had an opportunity to dive in Cuba in Central America and do some research with corals and with sea urchins while I was in Cuba. So two very different worlds that I've gotten to explore. Joe, I think you've been around most of the world, haven't you? Uh, I've been lucky and able to visit some really cool coral reefs. Uh, I started diving on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which was pretty awesome. Uh, Fiji on the coral reefs uh, in the Caribbean. So I've been able to see a lot of cool, cool uh, coral reefs. But I'm with you with the cold water diving. I do a lot of diving in the Great Lakes on shipwrecks. And there are some amazing shipwrecks uh, to explore in the Great Lakes, which aren't too far from you guys in North York. So I don't think you can't dive just because you're landlocked in Ontario. All right. Well, let's meet our next classroom, Mrs. Wong's group. We're not going too far away. Toronto, Ontario, grade five sixes. Let's get that microphone turned on. Whoops, there it is. How are we doing, Toronto? Good. Hello. Hi. Hi. What's my What's All right. Who's up? Yeah, so, um. How can a bleached um, coral reef turn into um, a healthy coral reef again? Yeah, thoughtful question. Uh, so we haven't seen many cases of on it, so I haven't read too much in the research, but if these zooxanthellae are able to adjust to the warmer temperature, so if that, if that algae inside of them is able to adjust and kind of get used to it, then they might return into the coral, which is really helpful. Um, that's the kind of the scary part is nature does adapt nature does evolve, but it does so over hundreds of years. So to have a change happening really quickly, that's what causes a lot of stress because they're not able to adapt fast enough. But if the zooxanthellae can adapt, that's great. And there has been some species of zooxanthellae that actually seem to be able to tolerate a higher temperature. So that's one of the ways that the coral might be able to recover is if the zooxanthellae is able to also kind of adapt to the warmer temperature or if the temperature goes back down and the zooxanthellae can return. All right, great question. Um, Mrs. Hans's group uh, hanging out with us in Austin, Texas. It's like hanging out in the library. Let's see how they're doing. How are we doing, Austin? <laughs> All right, nice and loud. Who's up with the question? What would happen if all the coral died off? All the coral died off. That's a really good question. I actually would like to turn that back to your group. Do you have any hypothesis of what would happen if the coral reached out? The fish would die. A lot of the coral would be yeah, All right. right. One more, right here. A lot of the birds would be in danger because of the birds and that some of them would die and then the birds and um, the predators, they all die. They don't have enough food to eat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, a lot of dying would likely ensue. That's pretty much what we're worried about. So because coral reefs are that founding building block to the ecosystem, the concern is that if they were to disappear and all those amazing structures broke away, then you've lost a food source for some animals, you've lost a hiding place for some animals. Uh, either they would move on or they wouldn't survive. But where they, can they move to? It's a big question. So and we don't have a definitive answer, but it would mean a massive change that a lot of animals may or may not survive through. And we're worried about that for people as well, because coral reefs, one thing they do the same as eelgrass or mangrove forests, all these coastal structures, they actually help protect us from storms. So for example, because you've got these crazy structures underwater, if a giant wave comes through because of a storm, 
its energy is broken up by the big structures. So those structures like coral reefs, like mangroves, like kelp forests, things like that, they actually slow down and reduce the impact of coastal storms, which protects us from a heck of a lot of damage because if storms crash into coastlines with enough force, they can break apart buildings, they can destroy roads, they can break apart cities. So they protect us from major storms. So that's another concern by losing uh, coastal ecosystems like coral reefs as well. All right, another great question. Um, let's see, I think we had a question typed to us. Let me check our chat sidebar, awesome. Uh, Mrs. Leeds class is wondering, oh, well, they had some similar questions about um, uh, what would happen if all the coral died, but then they're also asking, um, are there some other reasons why we need coral reefs? So we talked about a food source, we talked about tourism, we talked about uh, protection from natural disasters. Can you think of anything else, Rachel? I think those are the, those are the biggest ones in terms of kind of like a survival point of view, but I also want to mention that they are beautifully, incredibly inspiring ecosystems. And I never want to forget or like minimize how impactful the ocean can be from an inspiration standpoint and from an emotional health standpoint. Many people, including myself, will turn to the ocean when they're feeling stressed or upset. And it's a way of feeling better, of healing, calming, uh, all that kind of stuff too. And you get songs and paintings, photography, all these artistic expressions come from the ocean as well, like coral reefs. And so personally, I think that would be really sad to lose a source of inspiration as powerful as that as well. Absolutely. And I want to sneak one more in that I read about. And just like our rainforest, when we find all sorts of important medicines from our plants, uh, we have been able to find some medicines that we can use uh, from coral. So who knows what could be out there for us to discover if we don't destroy them first. So. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, of 71% of, of the planet is ocean, and we've only explored 5% of that. So I think most people know more about space than they know about the ocean, and yet most of us, unfortunately, very sadly, will never go to space. So hopefully there's a couple astronauts in the crowd, but most people don't get the chance to go to space, and yet we know more about that than we do about our own ocean, which to me is like, oh my gosh, we need to go exploring right now. There's so much to do. Absolutely. Lots of future careers uh, uh, out on the ocean. Um, Mrs. Thompson and Mrs. Smith's group are hanging out together in Peterborough, Ontario. Some grade three, four, and five students. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Peterborough? Right. Um, so what, what kind of diseases are there if the corals bleached? Oh, that's a great question. I am not very well read when it comes to the actual specific types of diseases. Um, but it's a general rule of diseases as a whole. When you're in warmer areas, bacteria and diseases survive better in warm water. So that's, I don't know the specific, I couldn't name you the diseases, but it is a concern and it's something we've seen on the West Coast as well. It's warmer waters are a really great place for bacteria to survive. So it's very natural that we're going to see some diseases as temperatures get warmer and things like that. And any animal, regardless of what the threat, if you've got a weakened immune system, you're more susceptible, so you're more likely to get a disease, whatever that may be. All right, awesome. And I think that we'll leave it there with some Google homework. So if you wanna dig a little bit deeper, it's a good uh, inquiry skills. You can find some of those coral diseases uh, that they're more susceptible to. Uh, let's see, we have not been to Mrs. Harrison's group. Mrs. Harrison's group, uh, is hanging out with us in Ear Falls, Ontario. Let's get that microphone turned on. Let's see how they're doing. How are we doing, boys and girls? A little bit quiet. Can we do that a little bit louder? How are we doing, boys and girls? There we go. Does, does coral only grow in salt water? Oh, does coral only grow in salt water? I am only aware of saltwater species. Joe, have you heard of any freshwater corals? Uh, off the top of my head, I have not. So I would think that for the most part, they're restricted to... Uh... I'm Yeah, I'm fairly confident they're only saltwater. If I think about jellies and sea anemones, their cousins, they only are found in saltwater as well. So I'm fairly certain they're only saltwater that's a very good question, because clearly I have me second guessing myself. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure they're only saltwater, though. Yeah, I did a quick 
Google search just to double check, and it doesn't look like um, anything's coming up. So it would be a tough environment with um, the water being not as clear and, and, a, and obviously a little bit colder, uh, not as easy for the coral. All right, really good question though. They're thinking today. I like yeah. that. Awesome. Uh, let's see, where haven't we been? Uh, Mrs. Devine's group, hanging out with us in Toronto, Ontario. Let's get that microphone turned on. Uh, How are we doing, Toronto? Great. Yay. Yay. Woo. Hi, guys. Hi, who's up? Who's question? Go nice and loud. Okay, this might be a bit off, off topic, but in the early 19, 19s, I heard that there's some more shipwrecks, and that was also close to the discovery of the giant squid, the largest vertebrate. So since you say that we only discovered 5% of our oceans, does that leave to be a more bigger vertebrate? Oh, interesting. Could there be bigger creatures out there? Uh, that's a really good question. So squids being the largest uh, invertebrate because they have no bones. I Yeah, I mean, in theory, that is potentially possible. I think there's a lot of species that we probably haven't discovered yet. And the ocean is so deep and we're still working on technology to get that deep, uh, there's very likely that possibly, I'm never gonna say no to that, cause yeah, there's so much we haven't, there's so much we don't know. There's a very good chance there could be something even bigger, which would be pretty mind blowing. The biggest vertebrate is uh, the blue whale. If there was any mammals bigger than that, I'd be very, very surprised. <laughs> but in terms of invertebrates and like, maybe there's a deep sea species that we haven't found yet, that would be super cool. Yeah, there's got to be some cool things left to find and potentially big. Would you guys have a chance, uh, look up the oarfish online. So the oh, oarfish yeah. usually live very deep. They can be up to 11 meters long, but every once in a while, one comes up near the surface or washes up on shore. Uh, pretty wild looking fish and pretty big. Um, so I am with you 100% on the, probably not a lot of large mammals. And I don't think we're going to find Megalodon kicking around down there, but there could be some uh you know something like an oarfish some things like that size which are still pretty big pretty cool uh who haven't we visited yet have we done one swing through looks like we have so i'm going to open things up for our second round of questions because we do still have a little bit of time so we'll see how far we can get but i do have one online from our group in uh Seguin, texas they're wanting to know um what kind of things could we do maybe somebody in a landlocked area like texas to protect the ocean that's or, or coral reefs in general or coral reefs in general that's a really good question uh, and i think especially in landlocked communities it's easy to kind of forget about the ocean because it feels so far away but if we think about the water cycle and how water is able to travel up through the clouds down into our lakes into our streams and we get this really big uh, cycle that helps keep our planet healthy. So taking care of the, of the water where you live is a really good place to start. So find out where your local stream is, your river, your water reservoir, where you get fresh drinking water from, and take a little look and explore that area a little bit more to see how you might be able to help that water source. Any kind of debris, chemicals, things like that that are going down our drains, that are going into our water supply, those can travel down to the greater ocean that can travel to coral reefs and impact those animals with their health as well. And especially when it comes to chemicals like sunscreens, for example, sunscreens can be very damaging to coral reefs. So those things that are washed into water anywhere can travel around the world. So I always encourage people to look local first, think like familiarize yourself with the water that you have where you live. And by doing that and getting your whole community to care about your local water, we can get everybody, if everyone starts doing that, we're going to have a big global impact. All right. Great question uh, from our group in Texas. Uh, if I should visit your classroom again, give me a wave at the camera if you guys have another question, and I'll start visiting some of the classrooms. All right, Mrs. Wong's group, your microphone's coming on first. Ellie, talk. Ellie, talk. You want me to do it? I'm going to do it. All right, don't be shy. All right. Ellie. Um, what happens if... The fish eat the bleached oh, that's a very clever question. What happens if the fish eat the bleached coral? I uh, likely it's not going to give them any nutrients. That's kind of the big concern. You want to eat the polyp because it's an animal, and that's going to give you some good nutrients and, and your tummy. But if you're eating bleached coral, it's really just kind of like an empty shell left. 
Uh, and so it wouldn't give you much nutritional value. So it's kind of like if you ate only M&Ms for a whole day, you might feel like you're full, but you might get a little sick. <laughs> All right, perfect analogy. That's really good. I like that. Um, where else should we go? All right, Mrs. Pimentel's group, your microphone. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just got some students in the background. So can you add that one more time? How long? How long has a coral reef, coral reef existed? How long have coral reefs existed? That's a really cool question. We think since pretty much the beginning of time, as they evolved with all the other animals in the ocean, so they've been around for millions of years, even probably before humans showed up. All right, good question. Um, let's see who's waving next. All right, Mrs. Thompson's group, your microphone's on again. Are there many different kinds of color of coral reefs? There's lots of different kinds of colors of coral reefs. If you can picture any shape in your mind, it probably can be found in a coral, which is really cool. So corals come generally in two different groups. There's hard corals and there's soft corals. And then within that, they can be as tiny as like the size of your pinky finger, or actually the biggest coral is, or polyp, the biggest polyp is about five inches long. So you can get a really wide range of corals all around the world. All right, uh, Mrs. Harrison's class, do you guys have a follow-up? How does such group affect coral? How does which, sorry? How does sunscreen affect coral? Ah, how does sunscreen affect coral? There is a chemical within most sunscreens that, oh my gosh, my mind is drawing a blank. I didn't know this one. There is a chemical within a lot of current sunscreens that is damaging to the coral polyps. It makes them really sick and it can speed up that bleaching process. So one easy thing to do if possible is just look for things like coral safe sunscreen and it's made without that chemical that, so that way if it washes into the water, it won't hurt them. So especially if you go swimming somewhere that has corals, if you ever go swimming around a coral reef, it's really important to try and find some coral safe sunscreen. Lots of stores carry it as well as you can. I bought most of mine on Amazon. <laughs> uh, so that's the best thing to look for when you're purchasing sunscreen, especially if you're going somewhere tropical. All right, and if you are curious about those chemicals, it looks like it's oxybenzone and octanoxate. Thank you. <laughs> do that effect. Uh, so try to avoid those in your sunscreen. Uh, Mrs. Devine's group, your microphone is on again. Would not the bleach affect every single um, sea animal in the water? Would the bleach affect every single animal in the water? Great question. Uh, we call it coral bleaching because of the color. So there's no like bleach chemical involved. Uh, so it's not, the actual coral bleaching process isn't gonna affect other animals per se, but that the trick with that is there are a lot of other animals that are affected by the warming water in a similar way. For example, we think about crabs and mussels, clams, all the, if anyone here likes to eat selfish, shellfish, raise your hand if you like to eat shellfish. Hey, a couple people, okay. I really like shellfish myself if you like things like clams and mussels. Their shells are made out of the same material. They're also made out of calcium carbonate. And so the tricky part with that is as the water gets warmer, that calcium carbonate is stolen by a lot of the carbon, at, uh, carbon atoms. So it's harder for them to make shells in warmer water because the water is getting more acidic. Warmer water, higher acidity. And that's what we're concerned about is because that higher acidity is making it very difficult for all those invertebrates like crabs and mussels and shells and things like that to grow their shells and to stay safe. Uh, and you can try this experiment in your classroom actually. If you have a cup of fresh water, a cup of salt water and a cup of vinegar and put a piece of chalk or if you can find a shell, great, uh, but put a piece of chalk into each one and you can watch what's happening. And that's kind of a similar process of ocean acidification too. So coral bleaching is just affecting corals with the color, but lots of other animals are being affected by that warm water, making them weaker. All right, so Mrs. Hans's class, will give you the final question. Microphone is on. What got you interested in the coral? Oh, thanks, that's a cool question. Uh, what got me interested in corals? 
I have a very unique job where I am kind of what's referred to as a generalist. So I actually get to learn about all different ecosystems and tell stories about them. I personally think corals are really cool because it's this tiny little animal that many people don't actually realize is an animal. And I personally love the weird, and this is a weird animal to me in the ocean, is that it's this little tiny thing living together in a colony and most people don't know about it. So uh, that's why I'm personally interested in coral reefs, but I am very lucky in my job that I get to talk about many different types of ecosystems. And I come from, I do have a zoology background, but I also have a classical studies background, which is ancient Greece and Rome, which doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> but I study that because it's really interesting and it helps me tell stories. So I really am drawn to stories like coral reefs where it's things that many people, if you just look a little bit closer, you find something totally out of this world and really weird and cool. All right, very cool. Well, classrooms, huge thank you for hanging out with us today. Uh, as per usual, your questions were awesome. And Rachel, every trip to the Vancouver Aquarium is a good time, so thank you so much. Uh, for hanging out with us, for letting us watch uh, that reef ecosystem you have at the aquarium, kind of doing its thing in the background. It was a lot of fun today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And I thank you, everyone, for your questions. As Joe said, those were fantastic questions. You always get me thinking when I do these programs. Uh, and I encourage you, if there's something that you're interested in, whether it's corals, whether maybe it's cold water, salt water, find something you're interested in and dive a little deeper, because those stories really can make a lot of world of change. So it's really great to be curious and explore a bit more. And if you want to learn some more with OceanWise, you can visit uh, education.ocean.org. And we've got lots of stories to share with you there. All right, perfect. Well, we will wrap up today by turning on all the microphones. Boys and girls, you want to get nice and loud, a big goodbye and thank you to Rachel. Uh, then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. Microphones are. <laughs> Never let me down with that. You guys always do a good job of the finale. Thanks for hanging out with you, Rachel. Thank you so much. And we'll see you for some more hangouts next month. Bye. Bye. We'll see you later. Bye, everybody. Bye.